Chapter Six of the Hand of Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hand of Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter Six: The Si Fan Move. A slight drizzling rain was falling as Smith entered the cab which the hall porter had summoned. The brown bag in his hand contained the brass box which actually was responsible for our presence in London. The last glimpse I had of him through the glass of the closed window showed him striking a match to light his pipe, which he rarely allowed to grow cool. Oppressed with an unaccountable weariness of spirit, I stood within the lobby looking out upon the greyness of London in November. A slight mental effort was sufficient to blot out that drab prospect and to conjure up before my mind's eye a balcony overlooking the Nile a glimpse of dusty palms, a white wall overgrown with purple blossoms, and above all the dazzling vault of Egypt. Above the balcony my imagination painted a figure, limning it with loving details, the figure of Karamina, and I thought that her glorious eyes would be sorrowful, and her lips perhaps a little tremulous, as, her arms resting upon the rail of the balcony, she looked out across the smiling river to the domes and minarets of Cairo and beyond into the hazy distance seeing me in dreary rain-swept london as i saw her a jazeera beneath the cloudless sky of egypt from these tender but mournful reflections i aroused myself almost angrily and set off through the muddy streets toward charing cross for i was availing myself of the opportunity to call upon dr murray who had purchased my small suburban practice when finally as i thought at the time i had left london this matter occupied me for the greater part of the afternoon and i returned to the new louvre hotel shortly after five seeing no one in the lobby whom i knew proceeded immediately to our apartment nayland smith was not there and having made some changes in my attire i descended again and inquired if he'd left any message for me the booking clerk informed me that smith had not returned therefore i resigned myself to wait I purchased an evening paper and settled down in the lounge where I had an uninterrupted view of the entrance doors. The dinner hour approached, but still my friend failed to put in an appearance. Becoming impatient, I entered a call-box and rang up Inspector Weymouth. Smith had not been to Scotland Yard, nor had they received any message from him. Perhaps it would appear that there was little cause for alarm in this, but I, familiar with my friend's punctual and exact habits, became strangely uneasy. I did not wish to make myself ridiculous, but growing restlessness impelled me to institute inquiries regarding the cabman who had driven my friend. The result of these was to increase rather than to allay my fears. The man was a stranger to the hall porter, and he was not one of the taxi men who habitually stood upon the neighbouring rank. No one seemed to have noticed the number of the cab. And now my mind began to play with strange doubts and fears. The driver, I recollected, had been a small, dark man, possessing remarkably well-cut, olive-hued features. Had he not worn spectacles, he would indeed have been handsome, in an effeminate fashion." I was almost certain by this time that he had not been an Englishman, and I was almost certain that some catastrophe had befallen Smith. Our ceaseless vigilance had been momentarily relaxed, and this was the result. At some large bank branches there is a resident messenger. Even granting that such was the case in the present instance, I doubted if the man could help me, unless, as was possible, he chanced to be familiar with my friend's appearance, and had actually seen him there that day. I determined at any rate to make the attempt, re-entering the call-box I asked for the bank's number. There proved to be a resident messenger, who, after a time, replied to my call. He knew Nayland Smith very well by sight, and as he had been on duty in the public office at the bank at the time that Smith should have arrived, he assured me that my friend had not been there that day. "'Besides, sir,' he said, "'you say he came to deposit valuables of some kind here?' "'Yes, yes!' I cried eagerly. "'I take all such things down to the lift to the vaults at night, sir, under the supervision of the assistant manager, and I can assure you that nothing of the kind has been left with us to-day.' I stepped out of the call-box unsteadily. Indeed, I clutched at the door for support. "'What is the meaning of C. Fan?' Detective Sergeant Fletcher had asked that morning. None of us could answer him. None of us knew.' 
with a haze seeming to dance between my eyes and the active life in the lobby before me i realized that the si fan that unseen sinister power had reached out and plucked my friend from the very midst of this noisy life about me into its own mysterious deathly silence End of chapter 6